So we wanted to create a network effect that every time we'll learn from one customer, let's say that one of our bank is running their services over AWS and they have been breached and they find out about it, they called us to investigate. We send investigators and what the investigators did is to fully automate the investigation in code. We part of our platform called Forensic as Code and we fully automated it. Now we can execute the same incident response investigation against all the rest of our customers that have AWS and we do it in a non-intrusive way. We do it automatically. They can either get a clean check. So they, even if they didn't ask for it, they get a proactive clean check. Hey, there was a new threat scenario against bank in your industry. We have learned that, we executed it and you're okay. Or they will get a different result which automatically trigger us to do an incident response for them without them even calling us. Welcome to Entrepreneur's Handbook Podcast, where we share inspiring startup stories with practical takeaways for you, the listener. Today we have with us Tal Moses, who's a CEO and founder of Mitiga. It's a global leader in cloud incident response. In the past, there's previous exits as well. How are you doing today, Tal? Ah, oh, fantastic. Thank you for having me here. So it's interesting how we met as well, because we've got mutual friends and I was talking to you at an event and then I realized how everything you've done has been so amazing. So I wanted to get on, you on here to share your story. Can you tell us, like, how did you start as an entrepreneur in the first place? Like, what made you go down this path? Yeah, I, I would love to share it, but I, I think a lot of it has got to do with my character and uh, different events that uh, happened to me in my life and changed the way, the course of my life, maybe. Uh, so maybe to give you a bit of a background of what I'm talking about, I wanted to mention that I um, got kicked out of high school uh, when I was 15 already. I never finished that. I never went to any academy afterwards. I did try to go to the Open University for a bit. It was a bit boring and, and I left. And the reason that I got kicked out of high school is because I was literally never there. I was kind of bored from um, what they taught us in school. I thought it's not interesting enough. I preferred to buy books uh, from different courses in the university and study on my own stuff that I found interesting. And the second thing is that... Um, been born in 1975, before there was internet, what we had in the 80s uh, is the network of BBS, Bulletin Board Services. And I used to run one of the Israelis BBS back then. And I found a lot of interest in connecting to other people's uh, computers, talking with other users from around the world, downloading software, and also took a lot of interest in cracking the software and later on trying to sell it uh, locally. Um, and And... I think this is already were kind of um, different in the tech scene in the 80s. They were in Israel back then, or maybe 29 or 30 BBS that I'm aware of. Uh, so it wasn't one of many, and everybody knew everybody. And I think this was like the first time I actually tried to do something on my own. Um, and, and that was before even internet became public in 93. Uh, then I went back to the high-tech industry only in 98 as a software developer. Um, I was a backpacker in Thailand, in Australia, and I worked in every different work job that I could find for 12 bucks an hour until I saw someone is looking for a software developer and, and they'll pay $48 an hour. I knew that this is what I'm going to do when I'll be back in Israel. Uh, found a job with a startup. And then every startup I went to kind of bankrupt you know, in less than a year. It was a big bubble burst of the end of the 90s, if you remember that one. And I decided that um, there's no real risk in opening my own software company because the worst that can happen, I'll close and nobody will blame me because everybody else closes as well in bankrupting. So the risk is very small. I didn't have family, kids or anything. And I started developing apps for mobile phones before the smartphones. I'm talking about Java, J2ME, Symbian. And actually, that company, it was a micro software house that did pretty well. And I managed to sell the software, the IP, and the company separately. And then I kind of... Um, I did a mini exit, nothing big, nothing serious, and tried to upgrade my life and live in a bigger flat. 
and they wanted me to pay uh, almost three times the rent I paid before that. And over there, they just regulated the new rule that you cannot wire money over 6,000 uh, per transaction. I tried to bypass that by converting the um, decimal um, figure into uh, binary representation. Because I left school in early days and my math skills are not amazing, I actually sent a negative amount of money to my landlord, and then he <laughs> actually paid me money. So naturally, I paid the bank. I called <laughs> I, I called the bank to explain what had happened. Um, and they asked me over to recreate it and show them. And then they offered me the job of being the house hacker uh, and working through a different company. And I accepted this job. It looks a lot of fun, like someone is paying you to legally hack into their systems all day long, tell them how I did it so they can uh, uh, make it better. And I had to issue invoices through a third party, which was a vendor for the bank. And after doing it for almost a year and a half, I decided that I don't need to actually issue invoices in someone else. I, I could open my own company to issue those invoices. And this is where I met two other co-founders and we opened Hectix, which is a company specializing in hackers' thinking patterns. And the company did pretty well. We became in less than six months the leading uh, information security company in Israel for penetration testing and red team. Uh, we did a lot of noise. And in 2011, we've been acquired by Ernst & Young Americas to become the EY Americas Cyber Security Center of Excellence. But before that, one of my co-founders, which was the CTO back then, had an idea how to automate everything that we do. And we invested all our profits into that idea and created a spin-off of a product company called Seeker Security. And later on, we sold Seeker to Synopsys. So my co-founder moved to Synopsys with the R&D. I moved to Ernst & Young uh, with the consultancy arm. Then I became a partner there. I've been there for maybe uh, five and a half years in EY Americas and a global role. And I've been asked by the global leadership to build uh, similar capabilities in EY EMEA, relocated to the UK where uh, I live uh, today still. And then I left EY to open my current company. So I think the story of how I became an entrepreneur is like uh, a mix of opportunities. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to me as well. I also love what you said about if everybody else is failing, then it doesn't really matter if you start a company and fail because it's expected. And I think sometimes having in the head that if you start a company, it's got to succeed. Whereas like I said, most people fail. So if we get used to the idea that you go and start something, if it fails, that's just normal. You can go and do something else afterwards. And you also had an interesting journey of flitting between both having your own companies and then working with other people too. And you seem to flit in, in and out of that pretty easily. What, how did you find those like adjustments? Obviously, going from having your own startup to working as part of UI. Did you find that quite easy to go from being your own boss to you? You were a partner, so you're still high up, but you also had other stakeholders involved that you needed to manage too. So I think even big organizations they understand that without innovation they will not survive, and they're very open minded to changes and. Uh, I think what makes them successful is adaptability um, and be able to recognize new trends and chase them. And when we were acquired, EY have recognized the need for cybersecurity and, and that it's only going to grow. When I joined EY, we were about 2,600 people in cybersecurity globally. And, and in five and a half years, we became 9,300 people. Uh, now, I've learned a lot of value lessons in EY. I've dealt with the biggest customers in the world, uh, with the biggest board, C-level executives, and so on, which for me was like the best university you can get for running a business. Um, see how huge organizations work, and then I could translate it again into startup life and say, okay, now I understand the needs better. When you're in a startup, 
you can be very, very agile, which is very hard for you to be in a big corporation, right? When you, when you go to a big corporation, like 200,000 people, like a big four, you can't really steer the train left or right. You, you have to stand on the last um, uh, part of the, of the train and try to influence it here and there. Right? When, you, when you're in a startup, there's only one cart which you can influence very, very easily. Um, and you can adapt yourself to the market needs and answer um, what your customers are looking for. How has, because you've obviously had multiple exits, that's something a lot of people listening will be looking forward to in the future. They want to build a company and have that exit. How did you find that process itself? Did you feel like each time you were ready to have it acquired, was it a difficult process for you to almost let go of your baby? How did that process feel? So interestingly enough, we never looked to make an exit. And even in this company now, we're not aiming to make an exit. It was never our goal to be acquired or sell the company or went to IPO. Our goal is always to bring real value to customers and make a change in the market. And for each company, we did a lot of influence in how the security market is built until today. And we can still see um, the influences of those companies and technologies that we've built. Exit was... um, I would call it a fluke or an opportunity or something that came along our way. And for each one of those companies, we had multiple entities asking us to be acquired, um, to do um, joint ventures and so on. And we were never in a rush. But when the right player came and it looks like a bigger opportunity to um, provide even better value to more customers, this is when we took it. How is the process of the latest startup? So obviously you're at EY, you're doing incredibly well and you're in charge of such a huge division at such a large company. When did you know it's the right moment and where did the inspiration come from for Mitigo? So in, in my last, latest role as a partner in EY UK, um, I came as the technical cybersecurity partner. As EY does a lot of stuff around cybersecurity, but some of them are around privacy, um, IT, digital transformation, identity and access management. I was the technical one for cybersecurity, uh, building capabilities of pen test, threat team, and incident response and so on. And I think maybe two weeks into the job, I just relocated from Israel to the UK. There was the entire um, uh, war between between Russia and Ukraine that they had not Petya uh, happening and wanna cry all over the news. And a lot of our customers, like many others, have been breached. And um, I've been called to come and help those customers. Some of them were down for over half a year because they couldn't be very well prepared. And in order to start investigating what have happened, I had to ask over 26 different uh, people around the world to come and go through logs, uh, connect to different systems, find how, where, which systems exist, what kind of log exist, try look for a needle in a, a pile of needles. And that took weeks. And I offered my peers to automate some of these processes by... Um, hiring a few developers, maybe three or four developers, and automate a lot of these activities. And my peers told me that I probably don't understand how professional services works because we're making money based on time and material. Uh, And and, and I, I think there was nothing wrong with that because we brought amazing people there and we did a great job helping those customers recover and they saw the value. But then it hit me that incident response is one of the only topics in cybersecurity that have never really changed and got better. And one of the reasons for that is the, the business model. The business model of incident response is very reactive, um, based on time and material, and the, there is no incentive for incident response vendor to actually be efficient. Don't get paid for being efficient. They get paid to recover the customer in the best possible way. So there's no reason for real innovation in that space. And there is a bit of a misalignment of, um, I would say, goals between the customer's 
a goal to speed the recovery and the provider goal to make money. And this is where it hit me that we need to change the business model and then we can create an, um, some innovative technology too. And there, there's a saying that I've, someone else said, I think I read it and linked in a few years back, um, that nobody has ever invent, invented the light bulb by, by just keep improving candles. Um, so we decided we need to um, invent the light bulb. I called Offer, which was my co-founder in uh, two other companies, in Hectics and Seeker. I told him about that. And I told him that what I would like to um, provide our customers is a free and unlimited incident response. This is how it started. And I have no idea how we're going to do that, but we have to align our goals to the customer goals, which is speed recovery, and figure out the rest. And this is how it started. And it's one of those things that's very interesting because, like I said, so much cybersecurity, even at the consumer level, is focused on getting antivirus, getting the blockers in the way. But as we've seen, even this massive organization across the world, at some time, you're going to get broken into because of the nature of how complicated things are. You can have all the protections in place, but if you don't have a plan for what happens in this, that's breached, then you've got a huge problem. We saw it with the NHS quite recently, so the National Health Service in the UK, about how that just shut down and it was so significant for so many people. And it's one of the interesting things is that there is a lot of risk involved, right? And getting into this kind of space, because if you're promising people to recover like their damage or anything like that, You've, it's very difficult because what about if you are unable to do that? Obviously, you've had this huge background in cybersecurity that gives you that confidence. And when you're starting that company, does it ever come into your mind about what happens if we're not able to live up to the promises you make? No, I, I think you're spot on. Um, coming from a lot of years of experience in cybersecurity, especially from more, I would say, offensive background for protective needs, right? Pentest and, and Red Team. It's true that nobody is fully protected. You cannot defend all the different um, footprint and entities that you might have. And you will be hacked and you will be breached. And, and now we're talking about how resilient you are, basically it's your ability to bounce back from any sort of turbulence. And what we promised our customers is that we align our goals. We want them to recover as efficient as possible. We never promised anyone they will not be breached, but we promised them that while they're investing a lot of money in lowering the likelihood of this breach to happen by investing in identify, uh, detection, monitoring, prevention needs, we will actually allow them to finally also um, invest money in their resilience or their ability to um, recover from those breaches. And... At the beginning, when we started the company, we didn't know or we're not sure how to do it, but we knew that if we focus our effort on the cloud only, and by cloud, I mean uh, the infrastructure, but also all the different SaaS, right? Like Salesforce and Monday and any other SaaS, Slack, um, we will be able to build something which is scalable and automated to help our customers to recover really fast. And we learn everything that we did from the ground up, right? So, so we sent people to manually understand how to do incident response in the cloud. And apparently there were not many people in the world that understand cloud well enough to do, to do IR. And when IR is being done in the cloud, it's been looked like on-prem, old school, uh, meaning they look at that as just another endpoint. And it's a completely different set of technology and understanding and knowledge. And we started automating all this knowledge. Um, so we just promised that we will not charge any money when something happens. And we will do our best to prepare them uh, to this event. And now if we haven't prepared them well, it's a shared responsibility. It will cost us more money. It will cost the customer more money. And if we prepared ourselves and the customer well, it will cost everyone less money. And today we managed to recover customers over 90% faster than any other solution in the market. In terms of getting your first customers, because this is such a huge deal for so many businesses, right? If 
the instrument response is updated and they can get their data back faster. It can have a huge impact on their business. And did you really benefit from your background here? Because obviously, if you think about a new company, right, it might be difficult for a corporate to go over a new company. But because you had that background and the EY and you sold other companies, was it quite easy to convince people to say, like, what we're doing is world class so we can get you on board? Or were there any struggles there? And how did you get your, your first clients on board? So, so I think having multiple startups and being in EY, I can understand the customer pain and the customer needs and, and know how to build a solution to talk exactly on this pain and need. And I think the number one pain that customers have is the lack of skills when it comes to cybersecurity and incident response in the cloud. And everyone that we talk with um, is identifying with that pain. Now, because of being a uh, serial entrepreneur and in the market for so long, as well as my co-founders, as I think in every startup, the first uh, sales that you do are, are very built on your own personal reputation, your own network, and it's guerrilla sales. You don't need to be scalable. You need to go to your network and, and try to convince them that you can provide them value. And I think this is the easy part. I think the harder part uh, is to achieve a real uh, market fit when you see customers that you've never heard of coming to you or you get to them or someone is doing an intro and they're coming with a lot of interest in what you do, right? So this, this is when you know that you actually have a, a market fit and not when you're selling to your own network. Um, and, and I think we changed in the three years we exist maybe eight times to get to this market fit. What are some of the pivots you made and what drove those pivots? So we were selling to customers that have a lot of uh, a lot of their footprint in the cloud and although we knew that we don't want to charge money per time and material i'm coming from professional service background and we sold something that they are custom to buy which are retainers and we instead of ours we gave them something which we call tokens that um, they bought in advance and allows them a variety of different services uh, on top of the incident response so they can have um, some value uh, even if there is no incident and one of the main pivots that we have done is to decide where we want to focus what brings the most value to the customers fully automate it and stop doing all the rest and a lot of customers that were very happy with some of the services we provided all of a sudden got a call from us saying hey we're no longer going to provide those services once we renew we actually want to convert this retainer into a subscription it's a SaaS subscription it's fully automated it will actually give you better value um and we still have people helping you when something happens we have a big customer success team when you have incident, you'll have the best incident responses for the cloud helping you. But until that happens, everything else is automated. Then we had to uh, figure out what is the value we can provide to those customers while, while there is no incident through an automation and through that technology. And I think that took us a while. So moving from this, I would, I would say, professional services with automation into a SaaS company with a bit of service, it was the major pivot that we've done recently in the end of the last year. And was that decision to make it more scalable, the model, right? Because if it's all automated and all in a SaaS product, then there's less additional effort per customer from your side. Is that the logic behind it? Yes, um, but there's a bit more than that. So we wanted to create a network effect that every time we'll learn from one customer, let's say that one of our bank is running their services over AWS and they have been breached. And they found out about it, they called us to investigate. We sent investigators, and what the investigators did is to fully automate the investigation in code. We part of our platform called Forensic as Code, and we fully automated it. Now we can execute the same incident response investigation against all the rest of our customers that have AWS, and we do it in a non-intrusive way. We do it automatically. They can either get a clean check, so they, even if they didn't ask for it, they get a proactive clean check, hey, there was a new threat scenario, against bank in your industry. We have learned that, we executed it, and you're okay. Or they will get a different result, which automatically trigger us to do an incident response for them without them even calling us. So they get those 
uh, threat hunts uh, automatically. The network effect is something that helps us uh, provide more value on the day-to-day. And besides that, they can always investigate back what they did well, what they did uh, not that well, how they can get better. Uh, maybe if, if we'll have time to talk about the platform a bit, I can demonstrate it better. Yeah, you can tell us a bit about the platform and how that works. So to, to go to a very high level, we understood that cloud is very different than on-prem in terms of incident response because of the shared responsibility model with a lot of the cloud vendors. Because that there's less policies and regulations against SaaS. SaaS is your new third party into the organization. It's very hard to control. Um, once something happens, if you're trying to investigate um, the, the breach, you need to first get a lot of data logs. And those data logs are not always exist or available if you didn't configure environment well in advance. And even when if they exist, it could take you a lot of time to acquire them. So if, for example, you're using Office 365, um, Office 365 will give you only this last seven days of logs. But if you want to investigate something that happened, I don't know, 10 months ago, because you found out you have an attack which is called business email compromise, um, it will take you more than 24 hours to download 24 hours worth of logs. And if you want to go 10 months back, it will take you two, three weeks just to acquire the data you need to start an investigation. So the first thing that we did is, is build a knowledge platform, which we call a forensic data lake, that we connect to all the different um, cloud footprint. It could be SaaS and it could be infrastructure, IaaS. And the first thing that we give our customers automatically is a picture of what is missing. You're missing a log over here. You're missing a log over there. Now, logs in the cloud can also be very, very expensive. Um, so we also point out what is the risk of not having a certain log. All of that is being done automatically. And we're trying to help them build their resiliency by showing them what is missing. Um, the other part that we will do is immediately start doing hunts over all the logs that we're trying to acquire, starting to acquire. So we acquire all those logs. And we also keep it for them for three years. So we can investigate three years back in a brief of a second. We don't need to um, wait for anything. We don't need to waste expensive time trying to understand if we have the logs, if we don't have the logs, and so on. As, as, as we said, the first part is the forensic data leg. We collect all the data. We keep it for um, 1,000 days so we can investigate back really quickly. And some of the logs that um, you need to acquire in the cloud, if you didn't acquire them in advance, it's not only that um, it will take a lot of time to acquire them, you might not be able to acquire them at all if you didn't enable them in advance. So this, this is a huge part of what we do, and data is, is a key uh, in this game. The second part is, as I mentioned earlier, we have something we call forensic as code. So every time we investigate a new cloud attack, scenario, we automate the investigation into our library. We call it Castle, Cloud Attacks in our library. And then we can execute it automatically against all of our customers' environments um, that we already have in our platform. We don't need to go to the customer. We already have the forensics data. It's only metadata and execute it. Um, the, the, I think one of the biggest advantage of that besides early detection, it's Sometimes there are, um, I would say, global cyber events or accumulative cyber events that happens to multiple customers at once. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you heard of uh, what happened with Okta lately and, and five months ago or LastPass or Log4j maybe half a year ago. Uh, but those are accumulative events that happens to thousands of customers at the same time. All of them are looking for help. Either they have the capability internally to investigate or they're too busy or they're looking for external help with incident response companies. And each incident response company will have to send two or three people to each one of those customers and to investigate it for several weeks just to give them a clear check or uh, further instructions of how to recover. With our platform, because we do everything in advance, uh, it took us less than 10 minutes to execute it against all of our customers' environment advance, in, sorry, in the same time. 
and all of them got um, an answer in 10 minutes if their order um, breached or not breached. So we can handle 4,000 customers or four customers at the same time because it's all being automated through the platforms and we don't need to send three people per customer. So this, this kind of um, handling accumulative cyber event capability has been huge for us. Also, it's been uh, favorite by, by insurance companies. So insurance companies that provide cyber insurance, uh, I think in their risk management, one of the biggest fears in accumulative cyber event, when they will have to pay all of our customers' claims at once. And we mm-hmm. are, for today, the only um, company globally that have a solution for accumulative cyber events when it comes to cloud environments. Just the last part of the platform, when I was in EY, I was lucky to, or fortunate enough to be part of a lot of huge incident responses. Um, sometimes as auditors, EY took part, and sometimes as lead investigation. And one thing they all had in common is a chaos. There's a lot of different stakeholders involved in the game, right? It's not only the chief information security officer. You will have the CEO, the CFO, chief risk officer, uh, the legal team, the PR team that needs to handle the share price through the media. Uh, You need to understand if you need to comply with a certain regulation in different jurisdictions of the companies and so on. There's a big chaotic event and and all this chaos is being managed with uh, stones and sticks. You go into Zoom meetings, there's a lot of Excel spreadsheets, a lot of PowerPoints. Um, which is very, very hard to track. So our platform also orchestrates this entire event into a smooth UI that allows different stakeholders to see simultaneously the same source of truth, but in different languages. So you have the executive summary, you have the technical explanation, you have a timeline. So everyone can understand at every given moment in near real time what is going on. Uh, This has also been a huge success and our customers love that. And looking forward... With what you've done so far, obviously you've got a very complete platform. What do you want to go further with Mitigate? Is it looking at expanding into different regions to gain more customers or new new features? What's the plan for the future if people are, want to keep an eye on what Mitigate is doing? So there are two things. A, it's about time that incident response will not be painful. You need to understand. I want to educate the market that breaches will happen and there is something you can do about it which is building your resiliency and educate them how to do it better, even if they're not our customers. So we'll provide a lot of technical explanations and blogs on how to do that. Um, The other thing that uh, we would like to do, the more customers we have, the bigger the network, also the bigger information we can share between our customers. Uh, Because all of our customers have a big presence in the cloud or they're going through digital transformation, we don't have a regional limitation. Uh, we can work with customers all around the world, so expansion is quite easy. Um, there is some limitation that for non-English speaking countries, uh, in order to do an investigation properly, you need to understand the context, and then we will need to find a local partner that can help us through investigations. So the SAS could be all done easily, but to the investigation itself, we will need a local help. Uh, So probably we will um, find different partners in different parts of the world that can cover uh, as much territory as possible. And third, um, there there is a play with insurance. So it's becoming harder and harder to insure against cyber uh, breaches. The premiums are going super high. Uh, The deductibles or access is becoming almost 25 times higher than it used to be. And a lot of companies are finding themselves uninsurable. If a customer is, is using Mitiga solution, um, the impact of the breach will be lowered to the bare minimum, which is usually will be much below their deductibles. And if we can recover a customer in half a day instead of three weeks, it's only the, it's not only the time it takes um, to do incident response, it's also less legal hours, it's less regulatory fines, less um, I don't know, loss of reputation, or you can handle the reputation better saying, hey, we got breached, but this is what we know, this is what happened, and it's already done versus uh, we're still investigating. 
Um, so we are going to cooperate with several insurance companies to make sure that um, those a lot of the um, companies in the industry will be insurable. Premiums can actually be lower again. And instead of just investing in the likelihood, um, they can also start looking on the impact uh, lowering vertical as well. One thing that's interesting, obviously, with what Mitsuka does, it's the idea that companies are always going to have moments where things go down and don't work and then how you recover from that. Has happened in your own entrepreneurship career, right? Where obviously you can't be perfect all the time, right? Sometimes you've made mistakes. What are some of the times you've been through that have been quite hard, but you managed to get out of them and come back stronger again? Well, I think that's a day-to-day in a startup life, right? I think one of the more important aspects in a startup, doesn't matter how small or big it is, is to make mistakes and to find out about it quickly and correct them even quicker. So you don't want it to stop, right? You, you, you want to make mistakes. Otherwise, it means you're stepping foot. But making sure while you're making it, everybody are aligned, understand why it's a mistake, changing direction. Uh, once you build it into the company culture, it's, it's quite easy, right? So we're sitting with our customers, understanding where we could have done better, um, what is it we can do more, building it into our product, into our offering. This is our day-to-day. Trying to think of a huge crisis that we had. Even at your previous startups in the earlier days, was there any moment where you almost gave up but then found a way through? I, I wouldn't say completely fail, but we had a lot of setbacks. So in my uh, third company, Seeker Security, we invented a new technology for uh, application security to developers in Agile and DevOps. Uh, which it was based on uh, my co-founder offers idea that basically helps developer uh, become super application security developers without understanding application security. They write their lines of code, press a button, and they almost instantly will get a result of where is the security breach and what they need to do to uh, replace that. And it's an amazing technology that's called IAST, uh, which we pioneered. And today, you, today it's, it's kind of common. You can see it in many companies already. And the problem was that nobody bought it. And nobody bought it, even though we really believed in that, because we sold it as a security product to CISOs, but CISOs didn't want to buy it because they're not the user. The users are the R&D. And the R&D don't have a budget for cybersecurity. So it was kind of falling between uh, the cracks of R&D and cybersecurity. Nobody wanted to take ownership for this budget. Uh, so we had to figure out how we're going to help those companies that actually wanted the technology, just didn't want to uh, spend their budget on it to buy it. Um, and I think that took us a while to figure it out. Um, I think when digital transformation started all around, all around the world, it was already much easier to explain why a lot of security budget have to come from R&D, have to come from the business units and others. But back then, that was a big setback to the company. Considering you've, you've been through so many companies now and you've had so much experience, what excites you the most about your day-to-day role now? Like what? What parts of the job do you love the most about building a new startup? I think the best part is when we talk with our customers quarterly, we get the feedback and we get new customers through our customers network that they recommend us. So you know that you actually managed to build something valuable for them that they think that they cannot um, continue without it. And we, we've proved our vision to be working. And, and that that's something that we will live for. We like the customer feedback. That I think this is the best part of having a startup. You believed in something, you had a vision, and everybody is agreeing with you. I don't think there's a better feeling than that. Awesome. And final question before we go to the end is, like you mentioned before about how you used to love learning from books when you were a kid. What do you learn from now? Is it from experience a lot of the time? Or do you still like to read books and other ways to learn as well? So now it's learning from a community. So I'm very active in different communities of entrepreneur, communities of cybersecurity, um, communities of venture capitalists and so on. 
Um, so it's learning about how different market trends can influence um, cybersecurity trends, the stuff that's relevant to me. Um, for, for example, uh, you can take a mega trend that happened in healthcare a few years back, which is customizations of medicine. Healthcare companies until recently only dealt with pharmaceutical uh, entities, with hospital and insurance. And all of a sudden, they need to keep a lot of data of end patients because they need to customize their medicines for them, something that wasn't heard of before in those uh, companies. And how is that influencing cybersecurity from now? It's, it's kind of obvious. There's a lot of privacy issues. Um, you need to manage it well, protect it, uh, the, the uh, PIIs and so on, right? So, so all the time, I'm trying to learn about different industries, the megatrends in those industries. And that's a lot of reading, a lot of forums, a lot of Reddit. Um, and it's reading a lot of titles until you find something that you really want to know a bit deeper about, read it, um, take your time. So it's, I think when it comes to work, probably all over the place. When it comes to personal um, development, um, still all-time books, always nice. Um, reading stuff which are completely not related to what you do about everything. Uh, just being curious. Is there any books you can recommend for anybody today? Well, I recently gave someone as a present Gedele Shabak, which mm. is a book I really liked about strange loops. Gedel, the German mathematician, Escher, the painter, and Bach, the musician. I think it's a book that I really enjoyed reading. I di it didn't really help me with work or anything like that, but uh, <laughs> it's just fun. Besides that, I think NLP books are great for work, sales, marketing strategies. So it's been great to have you on today. Have you got, if people want to learn more about you, learn more about Mitiga, where should they go to? So can either go to Mitiga's website, which is mitiga.io or my LinkedIn. You can put it at the end of it. Perfect. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for inviting me. It was great chatting with you. <laughs> <laughs>